Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome back to another one of our so softer side sessions. Um, before we get on with tonight's um, show, there is a little bit of an announcement. This will be the last of our Friday night softer side sessions. Um, but fear not, we're not going away totally. We're going to be moving to Tuesday nights. Um, we had set out at the beginning of the lockdown to bring these shows to you on a Friday night in lieu of being able to go out for a drink and things like that. But um, as some of my guests will testify uh, later on tonight, things are starting to open up again, and that's great. So um, to give you your Friday nights back, we're going to stop doing these sessions and um, we're going to move to Tuesday nights. Uh, we've been doing short 20-minute clips on Instagram every Tuesday night, um, and these softer side sessions will move to Tuesday nights, still on YouTube, still on Facebook, um, and at the usual 9 p.m. UK time. Um, what we're also going to be doing is taking them down to every two weeks rather than every week. One of the things we were very, very keen to do from the beginning was to bring um, bring things that were interesting. We didn't want to just be on here for an hour for the sake of being on for an hour. We didn't want to waste your time. We wanted to give you um, information that you were going to find um, interesting and maybe a different side of the industry that you don't otherwise get to engage with. So in order to keep up that quality uh, and to keep up the quality of guests coming on like I have tonight, we're going to be moving to doing this every two weeks. Um, and then we'll continue to monitor, mon monitor that on an ongoing basis. As ever, send in any requests about things that you want us to talk about. And during the evening, send in any comments or questions that you have. Let us know what you're drinking. Let us know what you want to know from the guests. On to tonight's show. We're doing something um, that I'm pretty interested in, pretty uh, keen to look at. And we're going to look at um, how Scotch whiskey has kind of travelled around the world. You know, Scotch exists in a wider whiskey world. Whiskey is made in a lot of countries around the world now, but no country can truly claim to have the same global um, footprint that Scotch whiskey has had. Um, so tonight I'm going to be joined by Hiro Ito, who is a director of, Tama of Tamatin and lives in London, um, originally from Japan and works for our parent company, Takara Shutso. We're going to be joined by Donald McKenzie, who is the owner of Isla Boys and Isla Ales, uh, but has spent a long, long time talking about Scotch whiskey in France for Dugas, our uh, distribution partner there. And we're going to be joined by Rumi Jaffer from Canada, who works for a distributor over in North America. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about those individual markets, but kind of use that as an example of how whiskey has grown around the world. Uh, we've got three continents coming on tonight. And as Scottish as Donald Mackenzie from Isla is, I will play the role of the Scotsman on this call for any of those questions. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome in my guests and pour yourselves a nice dram. Cheers. Good evening, gentlemen. Hi. Hi. Good evening. <laughs> we uh, we were just saying before this went um, before this went live that this is the first time that you three have met each other, um, and it's a it's a strange way to be meeting people over a over a live chat. But um, I'm very glad to bring the three of you all together, all people that I've spent a bit of time with and know. So, and I know bits of your individual stories. So I'm looking forward to you sharing them in more detail tonight. Good. Look forward to it. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for the invite. And it's a kind of more modern way these days to meet people, isn't it? You know, uh, by screen rather than in person. You know, uh, yeah. hey, it's new normalcy. You know, I suppose we're all millennials yeah. at heart now, aren't we? They've been doing it for a while. Yeah, it will do the job for now. Anyway, we'll we'll soon get back to being able to have a beer together and things like that. But for now, this is a this is a good little band aid to put over that wound. So, um. First question of the night, as I always ask, is are you having a dram tonight and what are you having? Hero, I'll ask you first because you've got a lovely tomato and Glen oh, Cairns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as you can see, this is the uh, tomato. And uh, tonight I'm drinking the uh, one of our uh, distillery exclusive, 
uh, only sold at the visitor center, but now uh, in a uh, limited uh, period of time, uh, sold at the, uh, in, by the internet as well. This yeah. is the yeah, uh, bourbon matured uh, tomato. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah, with, uh, of course, uh, some uh, splash of water as well. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Yeah. Donald, what about you? Well, I'm, I'm a traditional guy, you know, so I'm drinking the 12-year-old. Uh, to Martin, I've got a lot, an awful lot of affection for mainstream uh, 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 12, 10, 12, 15 year old whiskies. And I think the 12 year old is a, is a lovely dram. That's what I'm having. Good. Yeah, 12 year old is a, a cracking, I always call it a great daily drinker as well. And is, yeah. I think you're right. We're, we're, we're very lucky in the, the jobs that we have to be able to have incredible whiskies and try outstanding yeah. liquids that a lot of people don't get to. But that sometimes as a result, we overlook how how good the, the core expressions can be. So good to see you having the 12 tonight. Rumi, what about you? Yeah, it's a little earlier in the day, uh, my time. So uh, I am also having one of our core expressions. I'm having the Legacy. Uh, actually, not normally how I drink it, but having it on ice, just given that it's a warm day out there. And I uh, wanted something a little bit crisp and refreshing and easy drinking. So uh, that's uh, that's my choice here. Yeah, well, I know that a handful of your colleagues um, are watching as well, and you would expect them to be, um, you know, wait until later on in the afternoon. <laughs> And Lance has got his tomato and 14 year old at the ready. So good to see you, Lance. And in a I'm double glass, seeing... I suspect. <laughs> yeah, I've seen Mike Bryant's in as well. So good to see you, everybody. Uh, as always, um, please drink responsibly. I'm drinking tonight the 2002 um, Cabernet Sauvignon tomato. It's one of, I think this must be the only whiskey that I still have at home that I've not talked about in some form of a live stream or another. Um, over the last couple of months. This was released quite a number of years ago now, but lovely to go back and revisit it. So yes. cheers guys. And thank you very much for joining me tonight. It's yeah, thanks for having yeah. us. So we've got a, an expansive topic tonight, which is whiskey's footprint on the world. Um, but I'm sure with the four of us together, we'll be able to answer any questions that everybody has. Um, but before we go into that, I want to know, uh, a little bit more about your individual backgrounds, because as is always the case, we all come to whiskey in a different way. We've all got different stories. Hiro, you're yeah. from Japan, but you're living in London. You're Donald, you're from Isla, but you're living in France. Rumi, you're from Canada and you're in Canada. But hey, yeah. you know, we've all got stories about how whiskey and, and spirits and drinks as a whole have um, had an impact on our lives. So Rumi, let's go with you first. How did you get into, what is your role and how did you get to that point? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, my current role uh, is with Phillips Distilling Company, uh, partners with Tomatin uh, in North America as the director of sales. Um, if I'm to give you guys the uh, the funny answer, uh, I suppose I was destined to get into this business because I have a eight, or I have a brother who's five years older than me who, uh, as an eight year old, fed three year old me my first beer. So uh, from that perspective, I suppose maybe it was uh, a bit of foreshadowing. But uh, in terms of how I got into the business. Um, in all seriousness, uh, when I was going to university, I probably had every 20 year old's dream job as a summer rep uh, for Budweiser. And so I spent about six years after finishing my university degree uh, with Budweiser in the beer business. And uh, gosh, eight years ago, now time flies, transitioned over to, uh, to a new role with Phillips um, based here uh, in Canada, in Calgary at the time, and uh, relocated uh, a couple of years ago back home to where I grew up in Vancouver uh, in my current function. Um, I suppose it's kind of, uh, I don't know if it's coincidental or not, that when I started with Phillips, that was actually right around the same time that uh, that we were re reintroducing Tomatin into Canada. It was about six months after I started that uh, that, uh, that that opportunity came. And so uh, to some level, I feel like I've grown with Tomatin uh, in my role with Phillips uh, and uh, having Tomatin as a partner. Nice. Now, you, you mentioned uh, at college or at university. I know from conversations that we've had that you had a very entrepreneurial uh, travel and drinks related. Uh, <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that. Because I, I think. Uh, oh, boy. How, how do I do this from a social responsibility standpoint? Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, the, the long story short, I mean, I mean uh, is myself and, uh, and a couple friends of mine, we um, decided that we wanted to create fun, probably not so socially responsible uh, experiences for university students uh, by way of, of, we called it drink a small town dry. And so we, uh, 
we actually worked with a couple of uh, transport you know, pub crawl companies um, and identified a few community bars that were in and around the Calgary area where I went to university and, uh, and organized a little party night where we would transport uh, folks uh, to a small town bar. Uh, they didn't know where they were going. Uh, and uh, so we did that sort of in a fun way, uh, which is, uh, again, we probably didn't do it the most responsibly and probably in hindsight should have done it with a little bit more insurance and legal pro you know, uh, concern, but uh, you don't think about those things as a 20 year old, I suppose. No, still think it's one of the greatest little business startups ever. You can do that on Dragon and tomorrow and walk away with it. As always, folks, drink responsibly. Um, yeah. so, Hiro, what about you? Um, like I say, you, you're from Japan, but you now live in London, and I know you've traveled around the world with. Um, with spirits and even spent a, a bit of time living in Tomatin. So tell us how you got into, tell us what your current role is, because you you work more for Takara's uh, Japanese brands, right? Rather than- yeah, Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, in London at the moment, currently uh, my main job is to promote our uh, Japanese products. Uh, Takara Shuzo, which I work for, is the producer of the uh, uh, sake, Japanese sake, and also the shochu, which is Japanese spirits. So uh, as there are many Japanese restaurants, uh, especially in London, and also the other uh, countries in Europe. So uh, I'm promoting these products. Uh, that's the uh, one of the main job uh, I'm doing here. Uh, I, I, I have been in London for seven years now. But uh, uh, I came to Scotland in uh, 2005 uh, to join uh, Tomatin. And uh, it was actually the, uh, the first time for me to uh, live uh, on site of the distillery, uh, which is located uh, very far from the uh, city. Uh, so very uh, quiet place uh, compared to London. Uh, it's really uh, opposite. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, both my wife and myself uh, has been enjoying staying at Tomate very much uh, since 2005. And then uh, moved to London. Uh, 2013. But uh, originally, uh, after I uh, finished uh, school, uh, I joined uh, Takara Shuzo in uh, 1987, uh, which is uh, 33 years ago. <laughs> so wow. I got quite uh, old, <laughs> I'm afraid now. But uh, and then, uh, mostly I have been selling the uh, either sake or shochu and uh, in Japan, and also I used to live in uh, California and also New Jersey as well. Yeah, but uh, uh, during that time, I haven't got uh, any uh, anything uh, about, I didn't know about the uh, Scotch whiskey at all. So what I uh, learned about the Scotch whiskey started uh, since I moved to Scotland, yeah, in 2005. Wow. But, uh, yeah, been enjoying yeah very much. Uh, even uh, this is really a long time <laughs> now. Yeah. yeah. So you 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 joined Takara only a couple of years after they purchased Tomatin, right? Ah, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That uh, when uh, Takara and Tomatin got together, that was uh, in 1986, I believe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the following year, I joined uh, Takara. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic, and then twenty years later, you were you were living in Scotland at the distillery. That's pretty incredible. Oh, yes, 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 yes. And uh, yeah, it's really uh, as I told you, uh, very much uh, different from uh, where uh, I used to live. I have uh, only been living in a huge town like uh, Tokyo and uh, also uh, Osaka, uh, these kind of places. Yes. Yeah. So, so how how much of a um, culture shock was that for you? You know, moving to Tomatin, where there's thirty houses and a small village shop. I guess the pub was still open at the time, but that must have been a very, very different experience from you. Not only were you moving to Scotland for the first time, but you were moving away from a city for the first time. That must have been uh, some experience. Yes, yes, uh, for both um, uh, myself and for my wife. Yeah, it was really a huge difference. And uh, well, the first thing uh, we noticed was that there are many sheep. Yeah, yeah. instead of people. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, as you say, the, uh, um, much more sheep compared to the population of a human. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah. And that seems like a nice segue to talk to Donald, who is from Isla originally, um, and now in France. So Donald, tell us a little bit about what you do now, because you've kind of stepped away from your role with Dugas to an extent, and you're doing your own thing now. But how did how did you go from small Isla all the way over to France? Well, it's a, it's a very long story, guys. I mean, uh, I won't keep you all night on this. Um, but yeah, I kind of I, I ended up in France. I I, I used to. Um, you could learn French or Gaelic in, in the school when I was a small boy on, on Isla. I was born and brought up in Isla. Um, and you could learn Gaelic or French. And I, and I chose French because um, my grandmother spoke Gaelic as her native tongue and learned English at school as a foreign language. Uh, but my generation, you know, uh, of course, back in the day, uh, the government and the schooling didn't want people to really speak Gaelic. So it became, you spoke English and not so much Gaelic. Anyway, I took French rather than learning to speak my own language as a foreign language, which I thought was very strange. Um, and that kind of started it off and a very good teacher. And I became a bit kind of like, oh, France is kind of interesting. And anyway, as an adult, um, after uh, university in Glasgow and then working in London, uh, I moved to Paris for six months and uh, stayed for a very long time, <laughs> I guess, you know, <laughs> and moved into whiskey um, within the last probably about 15 years. Um, I mean, you live, you come from Isla, it, I, you know, whiskey's in the veins. I mean, you know, if, you, if you lick my, you know, my arm, it's kind of, you know, tastes, you know. Uh, um, so, uh, so it was in the veins. Um, and I had a chance uh, to, to work as a kind of, um, I guess it would be sales support um, for a premium distributor, which is Dugas, which is uh, the company that, that, that distributes tomato in France. Um, and, you know, you're, 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 you're telling, I, th I always think that with whiskey, and I think you guys would agree that, you know, you don't so much, um, sell whiskey as sell the story of the whiskey. Uh, you know, I mean, the flavor profile is is what it is. Either you agree with it, or you don't. But you're telling a story. You're you're telling a story about 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 people, about place, about provenance. And you know, France is a wine country. And um, if you're talking about people and place and provenance, they understand. That. Um, and so, for people like Tomatin or premium uh, quality whiskies, then. If you can tell that story, um, somebody somewhere is going to pick up on that. Um, and I guess, you know, uh, for a long time, I, I, I kind of got paid to tell stories, which is, you know, a good gig. <laughs> but there you go. Uh, so that's a bit size of it, really. And and now you, yeah. we can see by your T-shirt there that Ben Marnix pointed out, you uh, you run Isla Boys, you run Isla Ales. Yeah. So tell them about those companies. Well, I kind of, um, you know, as you go through your career, you kind of uh, identify things that you might want to do and things that kind of like, you know, uh, light your fire maybe a bit more than others. And uh, so with my, my friend, really, and, and, uh, to be honest, first and foremost, um, and business partner, Mackay Smith from Port Haven, which is down the end of the Rins of Isla. I'm from Port Charlotte, which is not too far, not too far away. Uh, we kind of had an idea to, to, to kind of like into our own whiskies. And of course, in Scotland, that's not so unusual. I mean, you, you can, you can, you know, you can, you can uh, 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 buy bulk whiskey, you can blend whiskey, you can uh, create your own brands around whiskey. So that's what we did, um, and we kind of tell our Viking story uh, with Flat Nose, which is, of course, you know, this guy who was called Kettle Flat Nose, was a Viking of the ninth century, um, and we kind of like, you know, have, have our own brands uh, 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 within that. And then we got the chance to buy Isla's only brewery uh, uh, a few years ago. Um, so there's nine distilleries, as we know, um, and there's one brewery. And, and the one brewery is now us, you know, making uh, uh, making uh, making beers on Isla, making beer on Isla, sorry. So, so it kind of like fits, I suppose, with our Isla boys uh, narrative. We're from Isla. Um, and to be over there making beer and, and, uh, and selling whiskey, well, you know, it's uh, it's a dream come true, and I still do uh, within Dugas. I still do a week's work a month, um, more as a consultant um, to kind of uh, help with uh, telling the brand stories uh, uh, to the sales reps or to the customers. Um, you know, I, I think you know as Scots, we kind of you know it's maybe a you know it's, it's easier for me, Scott, to tell you know your story because I kind of get it. Um, so that's still what I do. I still uh, uh, tell. Uh, Scotch whiskey stories uh, uh, across France uh, uh, one week a month. <laughs> there you go. 
Fantastic. And before we move on from that, Alison McNeil has asked, when will the Isle of Boys products be available on the mainland? We love them at Fish Isle. I'm assuming she means mainland Scotland. So um, it's, it's right enough. I've seen I've seen more uh, flat nose in France than I have in, in Scotland. So um, yeah. tell us about that. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, I, I, as, as, as we all know, um, and, and Scott, you know, you know, uh, Rumi, you know, Jesus, uh, I mean, we're well placed, to, well, well placed to know this. Um, uh, uh, the key to having, having, having uh, a good brand is, is distribution. Uh, and, you know, and that's the way it is. I mean, you can make the best, I don't know, honey in the world. Uh, um, you know, from organic bees. But if people don't know about it and they can't buy it, well, you know, what's the point? So behind every good brand, there's a good distributor. Um, and I would probably say, and this might not be politically correct, um, but I would say that good distribution is absolutely key uh, 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 to the brand. You know, I, I think there are people who know to make things and people who know to sell them. Um, and they're not always the same people. Um, and so to, to bring that story back to me, uh, I guess that, you know, and Scott, you know, the problem in, in the UK, uh, distribution isn't easy. It's a, it's a tricky market. Um, and so the key is to find, and I guess, Hero, you know, you would know this too from, from you know, selling a Shoshu or, or, or Saki. The key is to find the, the, the perfect distributor who will understand your brands, understand your stories and tell them uh, in the right way to the right people. Um, and once you find that distributor, you know, hey, uh, uh, life is easy. So I would say to Alison, you know, the key would be to find the good distributor. Um, um, the products are fine. It's finding the good distributor is, is, is as always, uh, uh, the, big, the big question. And I think that's something that kind of goes to Scotch as a whole. And it's one um, of a growing number of drinks categories and spirits categories where it's not just one brand dominates you know you've got a lot of brands with a lot of distribution um spread around the world so some brands do better in some countries than they do in others and it's really gone on from there so let's talk about that how, how scotch has developed in your individual parts and i guess donald i'm going to come back to you on this one off the bat because since the 1950s france has been the biggest um importer of scotch whiskey in the world um, so much so that it is the number one selling spirit in France. It outsells pastis, it outsells cognac. So why do the French love scotch so much? Well, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a tricky question, Scott, because um, it's number one in terms of volume, but not number one in terms of value. Um, and so that what that means is, of course, gentlemen and, and, and people who are listening to us um, will understand is that that's essentially because it's a, it's a blended whiskey um, and I would say probably entry level Scotch blended whiskey market um, and it's 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 a strange one isn't it I mean because you know France and I'm well placed to tell you this um, has so many different drinks you know uh, uh, you know from aperitif drinks to, di to, to digestif drinks after dinner drinks and um, from wines and beers and in fruit spirits I mean there's so many and a real very very rich uh, array, uh, array of spirits and, and, and drinks in general and to find that scotch is number one I think is, is fantastic um, I just think it struck a chord with the French um, but bear in mind we're looking at a, a, a probably a pre-dinner dram here so with friends, you know, you'll have a, maybe a, a scotch and maybe a mixer. It'll be a fun drink uh, to have with friends round for dinner uh, or, and you have that before dinner. I think the challenge that I have is taking those people who maybe drink whiskey in a fun way and don't maybe look at it too attentively uh, because it's a fun drink and it's a festive drink and that's fine. Uh, and we need people, you know, I mean, you know, hey, you know, it's pleasure. You know, that, that's the whole point. But the challenge I have is take those people or maybe younger, um, and once they get a bit older, maybe they want to drink maybe a bit less and maybe, you know, a bit more sipping whiskies. well, that's a challenge, is to get them and say, listen, when you were young, you drank whiskey with a mixer and you had a fun drink, and now the challenge is to say, let's go back to that and sit down with a quality whiskey, um, mm -hmm. you know, and enjoy it. And, and that's a real, it's an interesting challenge, Scott. Um, and I think France is fantastic for that because of this, whiskey uh, 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 people, people drink whiskey here um, now they might not drink uh, single malts and so much but 
I think, you know, if you catch somebody who's drunk whiskey when they're young, you can keep them going later on and get them to be drinking a bit less, but a bit higher quality, a bit more flavor, a bit more of a story, a bit more of a, a passion for it. And that's uh, that's my day job, I guess, you know. Yeah, fantastic. And again, just before we move on from you, somebody else is wondering where they can get your whiskey. Um, Pete Head <laughs> is asking if Flat Nose will be available in the Netherlands anytime soon. I guess that goes back to your point about distribution. Yeah, it does. It does. I would say <laughs> more space. Um, you know, I would say that. Good, good. Now, Rumi, we often hear about your neighbour to the south being the biggest single malt market in the world. But when you look at the numbers per capita, Canada is just as big. It's bang on like for like um, when it comes to single malt. So um, for me, the Canadian market almost seems like quite a new one. But I guess Scotch has been there for quite some time. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, a lot of it would obviously stem out of a lot of the cultural connection to Scotland. Um, you know, one of our provinces is Nova Scotia, New Scotland uh, uh, in definition. So, you know, in every pocket of, uh, of the country, for those that aren't overly familiar with Canada, um, there's a strong heritage tie to uh, to the British Isles, to Scotland in particular. And uh, so that would be the, the key root, if you will, um, that uh, that definitely has created the category and, uh, and quite honestly, um, you know, grown it. Um, additionally, a little bit different than, you know, some other markets, we have individual provinces that actually serve as a jurisdiction um, with regards to regulating importing alcohol. Um, so there's 10 different provinces that have their own, uh, you know, ways of doing that. And uh, some of them um, have definitely really opened up and made, you know, and helped create and facilitate um, innovation and exciting opportunities to bring new brands in. And as a result of that, uh, there are a ton of enthusiasts, whiskey clubs, um, a lot of event-driven activities. You know, there's some whiskey festivals uh, in all parts of the country that now are running 30 years of, uh, you know, of consecutive, uh, uh, well, this year being the one year that sort of changed that a little bit, but uh, <laughs> uh, with some uh, unique circumstances. But, uh, but really, it, it ties to that heritage. Um, and then the other side of it would be, you know, Canadians do make their own Canadian whiskey. That by far and away is the largest whiskey category. But uh, but funny enough too that uh, I don't know if Canadians are just maybe a little uneducated uh, with regards to it or if they just are sheepish to looking uh, and turning a blind eye, but they don't really think about the whiskey category as the whole. Um, scotch is a category, bourbon is a category. And in our, you know, in our country, Canadian rye whiskey, even though 99% of it is blended Canadian whiskey, which might have, you know, 1% rye. The, if you go to uh, any local, you know, bar in Canada, one of the most prevalent drinks is going to be, can I have a rye and Coke or a rye and ginger? And many Canadians associate rye whiskey as Canadian whiskey, uh, which couldn't be further from the truth. But uh, but uh, there is definitely a bit of a culture that exists. But stemming back to uh, to where, you know, Scotch would have, uh, you know, definitely made its mark. It would have its direct ties to, uh, you know, to the cultural aspect of a uh, of, uh, of the British Isles in particular, Scotland. Yeah, and I, I guess that's probably going to be the same for America as a whole, and especially when you look at the United States, the links with Ireland and Irish whiskies that they're undeniable there. You know, um, so it kind of talks to that same sort of connection. It's interesting you were pointing out there how obviously Canadian whiskey by far out outsells um, Scotch whiskey in Canada. When it comes to people moving away from the everyday. Uh, whiskey and soda or whiskey and cola in a bar and moving into quality products and high end and uh, trying to be becoming more uh, of an enthusiast, I guess, is what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. When you start to see people moving towards single malts more. Yeah. And it's, it's the style of, uh, of location as well, too. So the traditional mixed drink, your rye and Coke, rye and ginger, uh, while that's losing steam, that would have been the choice drink for not just younger people or, you know, all, all walks of life, but that would be the type of drink that, uh, that uh, would be consumed at more the party style on premise location when you're drinking several drinks uh, in a night or whatever, uh, or even home consumption. If um, you know, people are sitting there entertaining some friends and whatnot, as we've seen some in particular, you know, again, leading up to this year, but the on premise climate start to shift, we see more cocktailing happening. Uh, even the types of accounts, the attention to uh, to food uh, and uh, and pairings and things like that as well too. That's when we've started to see more of that premiumization. 
Um, but uh, but part of uh, and that's where that migration has happened. And uh, sorry, Scott, I'm a little distracted because you're frozen on my screen. I don't know if that's the same thing here over you guys as well too. He's gone. Yeah, he's really huge drink. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little. Uh, I don't know if it's just the three of us now or if uh, everyone can still hear us. <laughs> 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 but yeah, just fit. Just finishing that. Maybe that drink was a little bit too uh, too big of a slurp for him, but uh, but yeah, I know for everyone else that uh, that can see here, it's that's sort of been where the migration is happening and it's moving towards um, that premiumization. There's a pretty sizable price gap also between um, entry level products, um, and I know Donald, you talked a little bit about that with regards yeah, to France. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when consumers are talking about, you know, I know this is going to make probably a few people still roll over in their sleep, but in you know a bottle for twenty five dollars, that's kind of our entry level price point. You know, most single malts, um, even your entry level single malts are starting around the fifty to sixty dollar price point. So it's you know two and three times the price of a, of a Canadian rye whiskey, um, and so that definitely also plays a hand in the factor in that. But I was gonna, I'll, I'll rebound in that room. I, I think um, certainly in France, um, there's kind of a, a, a probably hero. I think probably you know in London and and, and almost certainly in Japan. Although I'll, I'll leave you the hand on uh, the, the, the the reply on that, but. In, in France, people are, are generally, you know, uh, trying to eat uh, less but eat better, and that kind of ties into a kind of health thing, you know, where you and you want to eat maybe more organic or, or local markets, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, um, what we kind of see, what we kind of see, I suppose, uh, uh, for the quality spirits field here and, and, and single malt and and tomato, uh, uh, um, is maybe you know people as they get a bit older become a bit more aware of things. They maybe drink a little bit less, but they drink kind of like right. higher quality. And certainly in France, that happens with wine. You know, when you're young, you buy in the wine in supermarket and you, and you buy bag and box and, you know, you don't really care, you know. Um, but as you get older, you buy wine from, you know, from vineyards that you respect, um, you know, from winemakers that you trust. Um, and, and you probably spend the budgets maybe the same, but you, you just buy less in volume. But you exactly. You just you spend the same amount. Um, but you buy less, but you get much higher quality. And I've noticed this even, you know, uh, I suppose myself as I get older. Um, you know, if I if I eat red meat, I'll probably buy, ah, oh, there's Scott. I'll probably buy maybe a fillet steak um, from a butcher, uh, but not very often, um, as opposed to buying red meat all the time, you know, average red meat and, and not finding much pleasure in it. And I guess that ties back into Scott. We're just talking about... Uh, a kind of a, a volume versus quality thing. And so maybe consumers evolve, and Rumi kind of picked up on that, and I, and I think he's right. I think maybe consumers evolve towards less kind of volume and, and more more quality thing. So the price, the, the, the average price doesn't change. You just, you just buy less, but better quality. And certainly in fact, that applies to wine. Um, you know, if you go from bag and box to bottles of wine and to vineyards you trust and and and, and winemakers you trust as well, and and I think that's kind of happens as you, as a as the market matures, you mature to to less but better um, for the same price, um, and I think that's a phenomenon certainly that I can see here in France. Uh, Donald, I'd even add one more thing to that as well too: um, access to information, people paying attention to what they're consuming, whether yeah. it's social media channels, things like that. Uh, even even just the idea to showcase, you know, it's not just a young person saying, I see it with the whiskey enthusiasts, uh, you know, here in Canada, people that are part of these clubs that are actually wanting to share their platform and their vision and what they're drinking, what they're showing, you know, to to their community base. And I think there is also a perception of quality that comes with that as well, yeah. too. I want to discover this new brand. I want to do this. And quite often, I think that coincides with premiumization and trade up as well, too. Um, and, and I think that's also been a, a, an impactful piece in terms of what's shaping uh, the business going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, sorry for that. My uh, computer just totally, uh, <laughs> I just had a blue screen and a horrible noise in the background. So, uh, well, you don't know you were, you were frozen with uh, your drink right in your mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we yeah. were worried. I just thought you were taking a really, really long. <laughs> really long yeah, no, that's exactly what had happened. It was nothing to do with the computer at all. Uh, but I, was, I did think, what a terrible moment for that to happen. And I know that on other streams that I've done, if I leave, the whole thing goes down. So I was like, oh no. But I'm glad that you guys managed to, to, to keep going. But to the point that you were both making, when you look at the sales figures for Scotch whiskey, what you're seeing is. Um, value growing at a faster rate than volume. 
yeah. and that really backs up what you're saying. You know that that is a claim that people are um, paying more, drinking less, and basically that comes down to drinking higher quality. Um, I do think there is a job to be done though to still recruit people into that very very early stage and whether that's the the low price blends or whether that's even drinking um other spirits like bourbons and things like that that they trade into single malt scotch eventually i think that's where a lot of work is yet to be done um hero japan and whiskey when you mention those two words right now people think of karizawa at auction they think of yamazaki they think of uh, of the fantastic history of japanese whiskey but behind all that there is a a real Scotch whiskey market in Japan, so much so that um, a number of, ja- of of Scotch whiskey distilleries, including Tomatin, are owned by Japanese companies. So, what is the what's the history of uh, Scotch in Japan? Yeah, uh, the very first time uh, Scotch whiskey came into Japan was the uh, around uh, one hundred and seventy years ago uh, when the American ship arrived in Japan. And that ship had the, uh, both uh, Scotch whiskey and also the uh, bourbon whiskey. Yeah. Mm. But uh, at that time, uh, of course, that was very expensive. So only you know consumed by the uh, very few people up there. Yeah. But uh, uh, and then uh, around uh, 100 years passed, and uh, around the 1950s, uh, whiskey has become uh, becoming very popular. But uh, at that time. Uh, most of the whiskey consumed was their blended whiskeys. And uh, uh, already the uh, Japanese whiskey was introduced at the time, but now that was uh, also the, not exactly the single mode that we call today. So I think uh, that, that was also the uh, kind of a uh, yeah, single mode and uh, uh, with the blended mis- well, whiskey mixed. Yeah. And uh, during that 1950s, most of the uh, blended whiskies, uh, both uh, Scotch whiskey and also the Japanese whiskey, uh, drank with the uh, uh, highball style, uh, which, you know, adding the uh, soda. And uh, uh, I think uh, the reason why uh, Japanese people started drinking whiskey in that way is, uh, first of all, in Japan, uh, during meal, uh, you uh, having uh, spirits as well, although uh, not straight or neat, but uh, we have a custom that the uh, uh, we have uh, uh, not only wine or beer, but also the uh, spirits during a meal. So that the uh, that has to be the uh, alcohol strength is a little bit uh, weaker uh, than the other uh, way of uh, drinking whiskey. So uh, they had to match the alcohol strength uh, to the uh, similar as the uh, uh, wine, for example, because most of the highball drunk uh, during that uh, years was the uh, uh, ABB was around 12, 10, 12 percent. So and also the uh, uh, because Scotch whiskey was especially very expensive at that time because of the uh, duty and the liquor tax, so that the uh, uh, people couldn't drink so much, you know, quantity of whiskey. So instead, they really uh, just drank a uh, small portions of whiskey and then added uh, highball. Yeah. Uh, so sorry, <laughs> soda. Yeah. Yeah. Highball. Sorry about that. But then uh, the uh, uh, gradually the uh, 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 people uh, who are drinking not only highball but also uh, drink with uh, just ice or even straight has becoming uh, gradually increased, and uh, uh, consumption of the uh, whiskey itself, including the blended and also single malt, uh, peaked once during the 1980s in Japan. But still, at the time, most of the whiskies were blended. And then in the 1990s, a single malt has started to grow in Japan. Uh, it started among the uh, whiskey enthusiasts in Japan. And uh, 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 these people who started to drink single malt, they really uh, like to study a lot about the uh, uh, single malt whiskies. So uh, Japanese uh, customers, uh, they are really, you know, have a, a very good 
uh, knowledge of uh, each single malt whiskey and also very uh, much uh, enthusiastic uh, about comparing and also the uh, 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 I would say the uh, and also uh, even uh, purchasing the very uh, expensive uh, whiskey uh, now. And uh, uh, now uh, in Japan, uh, basically there are two different uh, waves uh, of uh, uh, whiskey consumption. One is the uh, by whiskey enthusiast uh, who enjoys the uh, single malt, uh, expensive uh, single malt whiskey very much. But the other uh, stream is the uh, uh, highball, which as I told you, once uh, very much popular in 1950s, has now uh, become very popular uh, around, from around 2009, 2010. But that was uh, uh, mostly among the younger generation. And uh, uh, they actually, uh, at the first time, uh, they didn't know about the highball uh, is made uh, from uh, whiskey. Uh, they just thought uh, the beverage name highball. Yeah. So, uh, they uh, didn't care about the uh, uh, whiskey or shochu or vodka, uh, which the base spirit is. Yeah. So now uh, uh, whiskey in Japan is basically consumed in these two different ways. Uh, still both of uh, categories are growing though. Yeah. Now, I, I want to come back to highballs because they've become very popular even out with Japan but Graham Fraser's asked a question about Japanese whiskey itself and it's a question that I think a lot of people are asking now is we're seeing that the prices of Japanese whiskey are, are going up and up and up um, you know so in Japan scotch whiskey was at one point much more expensive than Japanese whiskey um, and his question to that is is that because of um, a shortage uh, is it availability issues of Japanese whiskey. I mean, when you look at the numbers in Japan, there's a lot more Japanese whiskey sold there than Scotch, even to this day. But um, mm -hmm. Donald, I'm sure you've seen it as well that Japanese whiskey is getting harder and harder to come across. So, is that because of availability issues? Yes, yes, yeah. The uh, most uh, biggest factor is the uh, availability is uh, currently really, uh, you know, they they uh, struggling to. Uh, get the uh, uh, whiskey itself, and uh, also they haven't got so much stock uh, where they matured in the past. Yeah. Now, g going back to your point about highballs there, and I want to talk about the individual trends in in each market because highballs seem to be something that just about every brand ambassador from every distillery right now is going into bars saying you should use this whiskey in a highball. You know, highballs are really the in way of drinking um, around the world, and the, the point that you mentioned was quite interesting and in that that was something that was around in the 1950s and 1960s, went away for a while and has come back, much in the same way that the idea of a whiskey and beer pairing, a Hoff and Hoff in Scotland or a boiler maker over in oh. North America. It was a traditional drink, drunk for a long time, and typically with a blended scotch and a, a low price lager. But now that we're going through this, I guess you could call it a craft spirits boom, or craft drinks boom, you're starting to see um, high quality single malts being paired with high quality beers. In Japan, Hero, now the, the high balls, do you find people putting single malts in high ball, balls or does it still tend to be the blended scotches? Yeah, when uh, this uh, high ball uh, re boom started uh, during the year 2009, 2010, at the time, uh, most of the uh, uh, whiskey used was the uh, blended, just blended whiskey. But uh, uh, now, uh, around 10 years has passed since that time, so that they are now uh, they have a variation, uh, you just uh, told me, but the uh, variation of some of the places started to introduce the uh, highball with the uh, single malt as well. Yes. Interesting. But also the, uh, uh, the strength, uh, would, uh, uh, people could choose their strength now especially for the, uh, these uh, high balls using the, uh, these uh, single balls. Yeah, fantastic. And Rumi, what about um, Canada? I saw your face light up when I mentioned the Hoff and Hoff, the Boilermaker. I don't know <laughs> if that's from the experience you had in Scotland, or is that a trend you're seeing in Canada as well? Yeah, the last few years, we've definitely seen more of that emergence, in that, uh, in that, especially in the on-premise channel again, and I would say less of that in home consumption, 
uh, at least at uh, at scale, but uh, but in the on-premise channel, um, and I think a lot of it comes and it matches with the type of restaurant bar that is opening, being successful, um, and that type of you know unique, creative, fun way to uh, to serve uh, products. But it also allows them to premiumize again and, and make it more profitable because even despite us talking about you know more premiumized cost of, of whiskeys on a per ounce level, it's still competitive for these restaurant operators to then charge a premium price um, and still make a healthy margin. The consumer you know, is getting a great experience out of it as well too. And then what we see, and I'm sure it's the same for, for Donald and, and Hero, is that then a lot of those trends will start there and then they start to make their way um, you know, to, to the home, home side. I think the easiest way when we talk about resurgence of cocktails and whatnot, um, you know, 10 years ago, we started seeing the old fashioned making a resurgence in the on-premise five years ago is when we saw everyone at their home making old fashions at home and having their own orange peelers and things like that and using different whiskeys on it and things like that too. So I do think that in the next, in the foreseeable future, if this trend was, you know, were to continue, we'll start to see more of that uh, in the homestead as well um, as, uh, as those trends typically shape from on-premise first. Yeah. And I'd say that the, the current situation is probably going to drive that even more. So, you know, I was speaking to someone a, a couple of nights ago and she was saying that when this all started, there was um, you would see bartenders doing little tutorials at home and things. And for the first couple of weeks, she was a little bit tentative, you know, how am I going to make something like that? And then every every week now, she's not really been buying spirits so much as she has the other components <laughs> of the cocktails. And the, her parting shot was very, very interesting. Everybody now has a cocktail shaker at home, and I think, yeah. I think the last few months obviously have been devastating for the on trade and for um, the hospitality business. But that way of consumption and that thirst for that experience has not gone away, and that's that's reassuring to see. Yeah, I, do, I do agree. I mean, you, you kind of touched on it's not just bartenders and things that are that are doing that, um, but it's the virtual community. You know, people, there are actual places now that are, are creating that experience, you know, for people because people, it's a natural way that people want to be. People want to experience uh, social activities together. Um, and uh, and I don't know, obviously, it's different uh, in each part of the world, but we've you know, spent a minute talking a bit about that before, um, that that element you know, it's going, to, that part's not going to die. If the channel might shift a little bit, the types of places that people go to, the number of people that are there, those things might uh, shift around. But the, I think the attitude around people wanting to engage with each other and, you know, utilizing spirits and cocktailing and things like that as a forum to do that, um, people are going to find, continue to find a way to, to share those experiences together. Not too different than this year. Yeah. And Donald, you, you mentioned earlier on, you touched on the fact that Scotch very much got its um, earned its stripes in France by being that that pre dinner drink and things like that. Is that still the case, or uh, has it moved on? Are there are there new trends? Well, you know, I'm going to probably be a little bit. I don't know. I, France is a more traditional country, and uh, and so what you'll find over here is that people drink their Scotch. Um, if it's a if it's if it's the, the again like Hero like. I suppose the highball and premium single malt uh, markets in Japan. I think you could probably draw a parallel in France and say, well, there's the entry level blends that are sold in in in, in modern distribution supermarkets, etc., um, and they are being bought essentially to be mixed with with sodas, uh, probably quite a lot of time actually Coca Cola or, or or a Coke variant um, and ice as a as a kind of mixed uh, 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 easy to drink uh, um, uh, uh, pre dinner drink. Um, whereas the single malts will probably be more mature, um, and and interestingly, uh, in France, it's it's um, the cocktail scene out with perhaps Paris and and, and the big cities is kind of France is a rural country uh, and folk are traditional, uh, um, and very often, I mean, I you know obviously as a, as a Scot, you know, we'll say, listen, you know, you can you can add water to your whiskey um, to open it up. I mean, here you were saying this yourself earlier on. You know, again, you know, if you feel it's you know, want to open it up, a little bit of water. Every bar in Scotland, there, there's a jug of water for your whiskey. You can add a little bit or, or a bit more or none at all. Um, but in France, that just does not happen. Um, you drink your spirit straight. Um, you drink your whiskey straight. Uh, if it's a quality single malt. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, so so uh, and, and and that's that's I think that's probably ties back to the cognac, Armagnac, Calvados, you know, French spirits uh, market where you drink something neat uh, and you sip it and you enjoy it. So I think kind of slightly, I mean, apart from again, again, uh, guys, you know, obviously Paris is a bar- urban center. And like all big capitals, it's got hip bars and you know speakeasies and stuff. Um, but in rural France, that's kind of you know you know we don't go there. Uh, we drink our our entry level scotch with a mixer as an, as, a, as a pre-dinner drink for people who don't you know get too much into the whiskey. Just they want they want a, 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 a an experience, you know, and, and you know they don't really care what they're drinking. It doesn't matter what what, what brand you've got. And then afterwards, you know, maybe people will say, oh, what, what kind of whiskey do you have? And you know, oh, you have a peated one. Oh, nice. So you have a Highlands in them all, a bit of spice, a bit of pepper. But they all drink them. They'll drink them straight, uh, uh, believe it or not. Um, and even the cast strength variants. Yeah. Uh, they'll drink them straight, um, which, you know, to, which is just, you know, the way the way it is. Um, but then again, the French are used to drinking uh, um, high strength spirits. There might be Armagnacs, there might be fruit alcohols. Um, so they're not afraid of a high strength spirit, even in the cast strength variants. I mean, they'll drink less of it, but that will maybe be the last drink, you know, before bedtime um, or after dinner or or whatever. So perhaps slightly more traditional than maybe the rest of the world. Um, you know, France drinks its spirits the way they've always drunk, uh, I, I would probably say. Uh, so it's slightly, slightly different. It's interesting. I've only been to France a handful of times. I think I've actually maybe been to Canada more often than I've been to France, but... Um, I, I certainly my experience was, you know, speaking to people there, there seems to be comparative to other countries around the world, a little bit more resistance to talking about Scotch whiskey, particular single malt in cocktails or um, or anything like that. It's, there's definitely a bit of pushback. And of course, that's a very sweeping statement. Um, Greg's Whiskey Guide's in tonight. I'm sure he'll uh, attest to the fact that there are some great whiskey cocktails out there. But it, sure. it definitely does seem to be um, not the most popular subject to bring up, as it maybe is in some other countries. Yeah, I think it's, it ties into uh, France is a very, very strong uh, uh, culture, of course. And I think a lot of other countries, but particularly France with the vine the, the, the wine culture, the vineyards, and um, there are so many uh, 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 different uh, 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 drinks in France, uh, made in France, that there's a culture around that. Um, and I think, you know, so so they respect, uh, to be honest, uh, um, drinks the way they are. Um, and so I think it's, it ties in more to that. It's, you know, this 12-year-old was made to be like this. I'm going to drink it the way it was made to be. And either... I like it or I don't like it, but I'm not going to try to make it change to suit me. Um, if I don't like it, I'll try another brand or another another drink. And I suppose that's where it stems from, Scott, gentlemen. It stems from a respect for the product. And so the product is what it is. And you know, if, if it doesn't appeal to me, I'm not going to try and make it appeal to me, um, which I find quite touching, actually, really. I, find, I respect that point of view. You know, um, and, and so I do understand it as well, uh, frankly. So we've talked about where Scotch got popular in, in the various countries and some of the trends. Um, we'll, we'll come back around to talk about the current situation. But what do you think are some of the challenges that the spirits industry and particularly Scotch faces in the individual countries? Rumi, I'll come back to you. I know you're yeah. very much on the ground in the sales there. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, I think the biggest thing, and it is stemmed directly to the current situation, um, is we we're gonna have a challenge with price. Um, just given the competition, where single malt whiskey in particular is positioned, you know, I grew very early in the process, but when I was looking at some sales figures in Canada just over the last couple of months, um, you know, the the industry as a whole was seeing a pretty steady incline for the last few years for the reasons we've been talking about. Uh, Throughout the, throughout the conversation, and uh, and definitely, uh, you know, it's hit a little bit of a wall. And you know, it's uh, I it's it's really early to to say it's one thing. Uh, there's multiple factors for it, but uh, but when we talk about you know the situation and, and what's happened and how consumer patterns have changed and, and how they're drinking it at, at home and whatnot and, and their choice selections, even you know not traveling, somebody like myself that would typically be on the road a lot, um, you know, not staying in hotels and, and things like that. Like, and you, you know, you amplify that with the scale of uh, things that are happening. 
you know, it, it definitely, when people are looking at that and they're making their choices, all of a sudden a 70 or $80, uh, you know, single malt 12 year old isn't quite as appealing as often as, as maybe, a, you know, a blended American rye or a blended Canadian whiskey or things like that, or even a blended Scotch whiskey for that matter. Um, so I think when we, as I look ahead, you know, that's going to be uh, a challenge going forward, um, you know, for the, for the foreseeable future is, is how do we keep as many consumers, um, you know, in that category. And the second piece of that is the way that we've at least, you know, done that uh, in Canada. It, we, a few, we will all reference the whiskey enthusiast. You know, that's been our platform. And so some of the the things, the events, the the uh, the ways to connect with that enthusiast, uh, we're, 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 we're right now working on some unique ways to do that. We're, we're working on some virtual uh, aspects to do it, but they're not quite as prevalent or as, uh, is scalable to where we would have had that uh, aspect before to touch the consumers and continue to make um, you know single malt whiskey brands prevalent. So going forward, those two things to me uh, combine and, for, and enforce a pretty significant um, you know uphill battle in terms of uh, in terms of the industry as a whole. I'm still optimistic that it's going to continue, uh, and I know the innovations that I've seen uh, you know coming specifically from Tamat are going to be exciting for us to to work in and continue to do that. Um, but uh, but I think that's going to be a bit of a bit of an uphill battle. Yeah, so that's an interesting point because I think I've I've always talked about Scotch as the most revered spirit in the world, and I still believe it holds that position. I still believe that Scotch whiskey, above all other spirits, is held in that high regard by the the average person. But I think what we are seeing is um, certainly more understanding that other countries around the world produce incredible liquids and incredible whiskies. You know, so um, the this place of reverence is now the quality aspect of that it's starting to even out a bit i mean japan creates some of the best whiskies in the world um uh, canadian club won uh, whiskey yeah. of the year a couple yeah. of years ago you know so yeah it does it does become a, a question as how can scotch whiskey still justify being that 10 20 dollars a little bit more expensive so that's mm -hmm. an interesting question to ask um Either, either that or uh, or we just need more Johnny Fox's uh, places to open back up. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know if we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hero, how about you? How about Japan? What do you think? I, I mean, I know your, your role day to day is more in selling Japanese products in Europe, but you've also spent a bit of time in Japan with Graham Yunson and Graham Nicholson talking to people about whiskey. Do you feel that there's any um, hurdles that, scotch whiskey has to overcome in japan at the moment yes uh, yeah uh one thing probably i think is that the uh, well japanese customers they have a tendency to uh respect the uh, uh aged you know age indicated uh products compared to the uh, non-age st statement products of course that would be gradually uh, a little bit changing but uh Mm, uh, the key is how to make the uh, customers to uh, have uh, uh, to uh, have, have them interest in uh, non-age products more, so that the uh, uh, pro uh, we have to uh, create the more more uh, innovative uh, product uh, which is uh, non-aged uh, to compete with the uh, uh, age statemented uh, products. Yeah. Yeah. And as well, you've seen definitely when we look at Japanese whiskey, there's a move from age statement to non-age statement there. So perhaps that with Japanese whiskey being so much more prominent will maybe normalize that move away from age statements in, in Scotch whiskey as well. So um, hopefully, hopefully that will peter out a little bit. And Donald, again, you, you've said that France is a very, very traditional whiskey market when, when we compare it to some of the things going on in Canada and Japan. Do you think that is whiskey's biggest challenge in France is this traditional um, approach? I think I think there's benefits to it. Um, I, I, you know, I mean, one of the things we've seen in the last few years in France has been the emergence of the aged rum uh, uh, category, which I think is, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it was a threat, but uh, certainly it's become in France it's really 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 gone through the roof um, and generally you're finding you know well 
age statements. I mean, you know, Solera aged, so it's kind of like, you know, make up a number, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, Solera 23, and it's like, what does that mean? Well, not very much, really. We made up a number, and, you know. It could have been 75 or 148, but we thought 23. Um, and I mean, I'm being a bit flippant. But um, certainly that, I think that's taken some people away. And the branding and the way they've been presented, the age drums has been kind of like, you know, it's, it's a kind of more modern copy of perhaps single malt. But generally, ten, you know, ten, twenty euros less per bottle for the equivalent age and perceived value by the consumer. Um, so again, Rumi, back to what you were saying on the price thing is that you yeah. can get an experience, a spirits experience, for less money, um, and because it's rum, and a lot of them are traditional uh, uh, molasses-based rum, so. You know, a lot of the countries allow additives like, you know, brown sugar and spices and stuff. So you can make it very, very appealing uh, yeah. to a modern taste bud, which is kind of like, I'm doing broad strokes here, guys. But, you know, a, a, a sweet, a sweet taste bud. Um, yeah. And, you know, we know that sugar plays a big, a big role, probably actually a very dangerous role in nutrition today. Um, but if you can make a sweet product for, to somebody, you know, then, wow, they're going to be blown away by it. And yeah. if it's 10 or 15 euros less for the equivalent experience, then I think that's actually had a big effect. I would say, however, that I think there is still a role for, I don't know, a, a certain amount of the, what you were suggesting, Scott, of the the the, the Scottish um, uh, whiskey industry and the Scottish whiskey industry perceived value. We are old fashioned and we do things the old fashioned way. Now, we might not be very fashionable, we might not go up and down, but you know, uh, you know, one every year we just keep doing the same thing. You know, and, and I always remember there's an advert in an early airport for Lafroig. Um, it's an old advert from back in the day. And it says, Lafroig, you don't like us, and that's just as well. Um, <laughs> because in small characters, there's not enough to go around. And, and I think, you know, uh, I think that's one of Scotch, one of Scotch whiskey's, I think, uh, strong points is actually just being traditional. And saying, you know, hey, you know, uh, fashions come and go, you know, rum, vodka. Hey, the guys, look at the vodka, you know, vodka in the 80s, 90s, you know. Um, but Scotch just keeps going down that same road, you know. Tomatin's making the same spirit, Scott, as it always has done. That's been what, like, you know, uh, uh, over 100 years now. Uh, um, and, and, I, and I think there's, I think that solidity and, and traditional respect for what we do in Scotland will, it won't, okay, we won't increase our sales by 20%. But we might stay flat or, you know, go up 1%, down 1%. And I actually think that's, in a, in a, in a volatile world, that's actually quite good. Um, the challenge is, to, I think, to catch people at the right time and to say, sit down, relax, pick up a glass, yeah. take your time. You know, the world's going very fast. It's a very modern world. You know, we're all on Facebook, you know, you, you know, whatever it might be, emails. Put your phone down, pick up this glass and relax. And I think Scotch does that still in a way that other spirits don't. Donald, if I can piggyback off of that as I was listening to you there, um, talk specifically about aged rum, it made me think about categories like that or even tequila for that matter that has actually probably copycatted off single the single malt business in terms of how to you know make your whiskey or how to make your product and uh, and share it with uh, with consumers. And as we we're talking earlier about you know cocktail trends and and highballing coming back and whatnot and listening to your point there, you know, about just be who you are, uh, continue to do what you're doing and, and you'll be fine. And I would say, you know, what I implore, um, you know, to Matt and all producers, uh, you know, of single mall right now is to continue to do that. Yeah. So don't get shy about innovation. Um, and in terms of being doing it the way that, uh, that we have in consumers, because they will, it's not that they left. They're still, they're still there. They're still, and they're going to be there and they want to be there. Um, and uh, and doing some of the things that you know again specifically to Matt done about piggybacking off you know different unique maturations. I don't know if Graham's uh, on the on the thing on the call here and video call here today today or not, but some of the things that obviously he's been able to do with the different rum cast partnerships, the different uh, variations and things that uh, are always happening, continue to innovate. And uh, and then to uh, to Donald's point, you know this is the revered category. This is the the market leader. This is the the gold standard. Um, and uh, and uh, as a business, as an industry, that's, I think, what we got to continue to do. Absolutely. And I think th the reason I asked that question was because John Lamond earlier on mentioned, I think it was when Donald was talking about, um, you know, taking people away from that 
uh, drinking blended scotch into single malt and understanding it a bit more. You're saying that education is the key. And I think that's a good segue into what we're currently dealing with as a as a world. You know, the, the global uh, COVID situation. For the last 10, 12 weeks, we've very much um, shied away from the conversation because it's obviously been very doom and gloom. Uh, we had a couple of very successful whiskey festivals during it, but... Um, Speaking, Rumi, to you and Donald, to you, before we came on here, it was nice to hear some positive things about getting back to normal. But I think from a education point of view, whiskey has learned a lot from the last three months. You know, um, Certainly, if I look at something like the, the virtual whiskey festival that we did, we were able to communicate with people that otherwise aren't able to get to tastings, that otherwise aren't able to meet uh, distillery managers or brand ambassadors. And maybe they sit with their whiskey in a rocks glass and have some ice in it and things, and they're scrolling through Facebook and they see this thing and think, oh, I'll, I'll pay a bit more attention to that. And it seeds that um, that thought in there. So I just want to touch on on you know the, the difficulties of the current situation and maybe some of the the upshots that have come out of it and Hiro I'll, I'll go back to you there and um, in in Japan um, how has the drinks market responded to um, to the COVID situation? Yeah, uh, obviously the uh, on sale market has been really struggling and uh, even uh, the uh, uh, Japan situation is gradually you know. Uh, trying to get into the uh, normal, but still uh, really uh, struggling. Yeah, the pace is very slow. So, for example, some of the, uh, these uh, bars, uh, they started to uh, do the, uh, uh, not the takeaway of the food, but also the, uh, you know, uh, takeaway of the uh, different uh, single malt whiskey uh, put into their very small uh, size of bottle, like uh, uh, 30 mil or 50 mil, and then uh, make a kind of a kit uh, comp uh, consisting of the uh, different uh, type of whiskeys, and then uh, sell to the customers. These sort of ideas are now uh, becoming popular at the moment. Yeah. Donald, what about France? Traditional market dealing with uh, very untraditional times. Absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, a lot of my um, uh, previous life was, um, and, and well, quite a bit of it, even just latterly, uh, up, and, up until March, would you believe, early March, um, was going to meet the consumer. Um, I think France is unusual insofar as there's a, a very, very strong base of independent wines and spirit shops. Um, and what they do is, um, is in a similar way to French street markets for vegetables or for uh, meat or whatever it might be, is you, you do a taste. So if you go to any, any street market in France, gentlemen, um, uh, and you, you're going to look at the, the fruit, uh, someone will say, well, here, you know, there's the melon, today's melon, try a bit of the melon. And you'll try it and say, yeah, hey, I, I'll, I'll take one. Um, but you, you try before you buy. And I think that's key, particularly when, you're, when, you're, when we're selling complex single malts, um, even complex blends, actually. Um, is to try before you buy. I mean, you, you, know, you wouldn't buy a car without trying it, you know. So, and, and I think that trying is, is legitimate because my flavor profile might not be yours, you know. I, I mean, you'd be wrong, but, you know, but, you know, it might not be yours. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, and, and, and to be honest, I, I really enjoy that interaction with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the reseller network and the final consumer, as we all do. Um, that's obviously come to a halt. Um, there have been some innovations, and, and 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 this is perhaps this is perhaps one of them. Um, I think what will have to happen is that um, we'll have to do tastings, uh, distance tastings. And I, I know that Colhoman uh, latterly did a tasting uh, where they sent out sample packs. You could buy them online, and um, as a final consumer, and you got your sample pack. And then uh, down the line, there was a there was a Zoom call with uh, one of the guys. I think it was one of the Will's uh, uh, guys from Colhoman who did an online tasting with the sample packs that you had bought, and he commented them uh, as you were, you know. So I think that's that's intelligent and uh, and interesting. I think we have to keep somehow um, some way of having consumers taste because yeah. you, know, we, you know ultimately we don't we sell stories, you know for sure. But if, if 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 you don't like peated whiskey, and, and that's legitimate, I mean, some people just don't. You know, it's just not their cup of tea for some strange reason. You know, I, mean, I don't understand. Um, but if, if you don't like it, there's no point in me telling you to like it because you'll say no. Listen, honestly, it doesn't 
doesn't light my fire. So I think we have to still do that. And I think that kind of shows a way forward. Um, and I think this kind of thing, Scott, I mean, you know, here, this is a perfect example. You know, this wasn't done before. Um, yeah. I think it's, it's a way for perhaps some of the people in the industry um, to share some of the stuff they maybe want to talk about. I don't know if people are interested or not. I mean, but, but you know, I think this is, this is a way forward. Um, and thankfully, and we've all discovered things like Zoom that we never knew about before, you know. Um, we've discovered a way of, of, um, of actually interacting with people. And interestingly, and I'll finish on this point because otherwise I'll talk all night, but um, I do a lot of um, uh, 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 staff training in France. Uh, for wines and spirit shop staff who generally know a great deal about wine and perhaps too about whiskey, to be honest. But I do a lot of training, and generally up until March, I was still doing them, would you believe? Um, what we call, what I call spirits academies, um, and that's basically you know you, you get shop staff into a central hotel, whatever it is, uh, and, and you do a, a, a training course on what is whiskey. And luckily, I was talking about um, uh, uh, malted barley um, and also phenol levels in, 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 in if, if, if using peat smoke and, and how you can adjust those things. Um, and now what we're doing is doing that, well, doing it by Zoom. So I can take my PowerPoint file um, and I can have you guys, if you're shop owners, come on to a private Zoom session and we can spend an hour together uh, talking about in-depth uh, 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 subjects around whiskey. And, and that's the challenge going forward. But I, beyond that, it's about getting things tasted. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an old-fashioned guy, and I, and I do think that tasting is adopting. You know, uh, uh, I mean, we all know, we've all met people, you know, when you, when you, you, you say have a dram to somebody, and, and, you know, and they taste it, and they go, wow, you know, and you just know you've, you've convinced somebody to adopt uh, uh, that brand, to adopt that whiskey, because they've just had a, had a wow moment. And I think the challenge is to try to keep doing that. Whatever we do, we have to keep doing that. Now, before I move on to, to Rumi, just briefly, um, how are things progressing with the plans to build a distillery? Uh, the last I spoke to you, that was still going through the crowdfunding process, but obviously the, the this year has maybe thrown a bit of a spanner in that work. So how's how's that going ahead? Oh, wow, that's a, that's a, that's a curveball. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it's it's uh, this just gentlemen, so you know, um, with the brewery, you know, we were independent bottler. Um, we have a brewery, and uh, it'll come as no surprise to you, gentlemen, that uh, when you make beer, you're you know, you're one step away from making whiskey. You know, just put a still on the end of your fermenting vessel and bang it through the still. You know, it's it's you know it's dead easy. You know, I mean, as Graham would tell us, you know, yeah, it's dead easy. Um, um, and so so yeah, so we have this project on Isla to turn our brewery into a bigger brewery because we can't meet demand, and to also uh, while we're doing it, stick a still on the end of it. That's kind of our dream with me and Mackay to do that. Um, so yes, it's it's. It, would you believe it's still? It's the project is still there this year. I mean, you know, for all of us, it's kind of like throwing a spanner in the works because simply to get people over Tyler to do things like planning um, or, or or soil analysis or whatever it might be is has been impossible, and it still is impossible. So it's kind of frozen, um, but only frozen. It will be thawed out. Uh, we hope, we hope uh, uh, autumn, autumn, winter time. And I would say again, watch this space. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah, we the plans are definitely there. I mean, uh, nothing would give me more pleasure than to stick a still at the end of the end of the brewery, take some <laughs> of the beer, painting vessel, and bloody still it. You know, shit, stick it in a bourbon cask. What's going? You know, what could go wrong? You know. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and Ruby, what about you? I, we had a comment in from Donner Pass Whiskey saying, um, in California, stores are allowed to do wine and beer tastings, but not distilled spirits. US liquor laws are a patchwork of 50 states with yeah. prohibition left over weirdness. And to, to your point earlier on, Canada's in a similar way with different control boards. So how has that all responded right now? I know you were saying earlier on that things seem to be opening up a little bit again but yeah and that was more so from the you know the the business not just the the whiskey business or the or it's distilled spirits of evangelical business but just people on the whole but they're definitely so i mean similar to, to the california comment yeah most uh provinces are very much still under uh you know very scrutinized um limited store hours closures uh even you know some of our biggest provinces uh, Ontario, as an example, only has portions of the province that has restaurants that are now even able to operate with any guests beyond just takeout and whatnot. So that whole process has been pretty slow. Um, and you know, generally, some of the comments that Hero made about the on-premise and the off-premise uh, with regards to Japan very similar. You know, in Canada, even for the states for that matter, um, I would say 
couple of unique things that we observed was, uh, you know, there are definitely pockets and periods where people, when they, you know, were not at work, when they're at home, when they can't go and do not just the work things, but the other activities that may occupy time, when I can't, you know, do my spring cleaning, cleaning project uh, to build the fence in my backyard because I can't go, go get lumber for that. I think it actually increased, um, you know, some of the occasions of consumption at home. But the brands and the categories that typically saw that upswing were kind of just quickly tried and tested, you know, brands that consumers trusted. Interestingly enough, what we've seen in Canada, in part because of, you know, the individual jurisdiction legislation is each province acts as both the, the responsible legislative arm, but they also collect a significant amount of revenue. So it's kind of counterintuitive uh, in that sense. That's a whole different conversation in itself. But uh, but from there, um, we actually have seen a lot of progress at a much quicker pace than traditionally. Things that would have taken 10 years before to, to be an idea and actually come into fruition. There's been some shifts that have happened in months. Like um, so here I talked a little bit about, you know, smaller sizes from the on-premise channel and, and places, you know, packaging that out. Um, there's been legislative changes in individual provinces, even even certain areas that are allowing public consumption in, you know, non-sanctioned traditional places like your home or uh, whatnot. So, you know, we, we're not quite Las Vegas. We don't have people, uh, you know, strips all over Canada uh, and entertainment districts. But, you know, things like that, that six months ago would have been totally a, a, a thought that wouldn't have, you know, actually been a consideration. And so it's been interesting to actually see the legislative thing. The other interesting piece is the actual consumer shopping experience. So, you know, in a lot of instances, when we talk about the masses as a whole, you know, we would see upswings that were even associated to, to two week pay cycles. So when people are going to the grocery store to get all their groceries and get their, their things for their pantry, that beverage alcohol shop may have been happening at the same time as well too. So you'd see these kind of weird pockets and lifts. And then the other aspect would be um, in Canada, online purchasing was a tiny piece of, of the, the market. You know, everyone uses Amazon and everyone uses all these other grocery delivery things and like that previously. But for whatever reason, beverage alcohol was never a forum which actually is quite surprising because a lot of the consumption, a lot, not all, but a lot of the consumption when people go to a liquor store, they're quite often purchasing for immediate consumption. So you think, hey, online delivery makes more sense, buy when I need it, but it just didn't exist. There's forums, whether it's in our instance, some of the ju jurisdictions have actually got their own infrastructure in place, but then now there's third party companies. Uh, there's a big company in the US called Drizzly that their membership subscription, you know, it's completely through the roof. Like they you know, can't even keep up with that. Uh, with, uh, with how these things are going. And I'm, what I think is that, you know, with consumers, like once you, once you change and, and kind of give them an avenue and an opportunity, you know, when bars and restaurants are opening up, it's not like Zoom's gonna get forgotten about. There's still gonna be that interaction, right? So as things, you know, do progress, like this whole aspect of people seeking and discovering products even through that forum, um, that'll be interesting to see because uh, I don't think it's going to go away. You know, as people become accustomed to it and discover it, it's kind of like, you know, we're creatures of our own habit. And then once something becomes normal and this is the way I do it, this is the path that I take, um, it becomes a little bit more of a behavioral thing. So again, I think as, as we pay attention to the business going forward, um, that'll be a very, very uh, interesting piece for us to, to understand and, uh, and, and try to capitalize on. Because I also think it links back to what Donald was saying about, you know, how do you engage with that consumer? Um, you know, taste, try before you buy these elements, there's going to be different ways that we're going to have to, uh, to, to shape that and figure that out. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I, sorry, I'll go down. No, no, I, I, sorry, I, I agree. I think, I think the online thing is interesting because I think, you know, um, for a lot of people, and I, and I think for, you know, in, in France, certainly for traditional uh, mom and pop stores, uh, it always has been the danger of the Amazons of this world, which are seen as being all-encompassing uh, yeah. monsters that, 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 that kind of eat up, eat up everything in their path. And interestingly, during lockdown, one of the the few ways of, 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 of buying stuff um, for your home or whatever it was, was Amazon. Uh, yeah. They were still delivering. Um, and it is no surprise that Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos is the world's richest man. <laughs> you know, but at the same time, you know, that's a reality that we have yeah. to age with you know and and you know it's just it's just it's just it's just the way of the world you know um there's no you know it's, it is what it is um yeah. 
Uh, and and I think part of what he does very well, or not just Jeff, but the whole the whole Amazon business model, is delivery, is prime, is uh, knowing it's going to come tomorrow, um, and it's delivered tomorrow. And you live in the sticks, whatever you might be, and, it, and it's never delivered tomorrow. Or same day delivery if you live in a big city, which is you know which is remarkable. And it's it's service. And I think yeah. one of the big keys for us, perhaps in the industry, is service. How do we service our customers efficiently in today's world where people want something now? Maybe tomorrow, yeah. but not yeah. next week. You know, next week is like that's oh, Jesus. That didn't quite. You know, um, and I think that's a challenge as well. And I've been, but the online thing, Rumi, if I can time to that aspect of what you were saying, I yeah. think is you know it's a, it's a, it's a new one for us all. And it's like how do we interact with this big beast that will surely only grow? I mean, let's be honest. You know, uh, people are on mobile devices. They're on their computer. They're on a tablet. You know, they want to buy nappies, milk, sugar, and it might be wines and spirits now, Remy. Um, and that's what they do. They swipe left, swipe right, you know, and it's in the basket and it goes. Well, and it's it's mind boggling to like two years ago, I wouldn't have ever thought that I'm, and I, I'm not the person that does this, but many people do, you know, buy your fruit and have it delivered. The idea of not picking the fruit off my shelf well, still is foreign to me, but for a lot of people that that, that isn't the case. And so again, you know, when we when we even as much as we talk about the importance of people and consumers wanting to try product, and yes, I don't think that that's ever going to go away and it's going to continue to be prevalent. But how we how we engage with those consumers um, is what is is very very rapidly changing. Um, and, uh, and and you know and yeah, you know, just when you think about that, you know, a couple of years from now, maybe the traditional way of sampling and tasting product and whatnot. You know, I'm not going to say it's going to completely go away and, and, and be gone, but there's going to be different elements that people are going to use and discover uh, to make their purchases. And uh, and so, and I just I always liken it back to like grocery shopping or retail shopping when I when I try to think of those comparisons. And again, I, it still baffles me, but people will buy their produce and have it delivered. And, and um, uh, I don't think I'll ever understand that. But um, on on the point you were making there, I think there is a way that um, this technology can um help service and that is in the form of training in the sense that a couple of weeks ago i was able to do a training session for bartenders in mexico um mm -hmm. from the comfort of my uh, front room you know and mexico is not a market that is a massive one for us so we're never going to be able to actually go out there and, and do things like that but if if we're able to do zoom trainings for bartenders so that now they're contacting directly with the distillery rather than someone who's maybe three, four steps removed and is doing a, a training in a bar um, and then going in with another brand the next week and another brand the, another week. To have someone from the distillery to be able to do that training, I think can only help add that level of knowledge um, that they can then pass on to their their. Um, their punters. And the same goes for, for the retail environment. Um, and it's it's great for us as well because we're able to find out what's going on in the markets and and keep the finger on, on the pulse, pulse in a in a new way. So I, I would hope to see that 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 element continues to flourish and help uh, with service. But gents, we're an hour and twenty minutes tonight, so um, I, I think we'll we'll wrap up. And I'll just say thank you very much for your time. For everyone that's still watching and maybe missed the beginning, this is the last of our Friday night sessions. Um, we're not going away completely. We're moving to Tuesday nights and we're going to be every two weeks. So the first of our Tuesday night softer side sessions will be on the 30th of June. And I'll be joined by Andy Gemmel, who is the owner of The Gate in Glasgow and has recently established Whiskey Wonderland, which is a fascinating um, platform that I'm looking forward to chatting to him about. But gentlemen, thank you very, very much for your time. Um, I know Donald, sure. it's a little late with you. Rumi, it's a little bit early with you. <laughs> You're all we're on the same time frame, but I still appreciate you, you, you taking the time to do this. So thank you very much. And here's hoping to having a another dram in person very very soon absolutely uh, all the fathers out there happy happy father's day this weekend so uh, absolutely yeah. 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 <laughs> hero uh, gentlemen pleasure uh, chatting with you as well too uh slange slange